Scott, can you take us through a realistic scenario of a screenwriter pitching an idea to an executive? Where does it begin? Usually, it takes a good amount of schmoozing to get the meeting in the first place. Um, so there is a lot of, you know, sort of getting your foot in the door professionally. Um, when the meeting actually is secured, it usually starts at log lines. Usually an executive on the other side of the room is looking for specific types of programs. They'll want, they'll be kind of overly specific in terms of like, they want mysteries about X, Y, Z. They want romances about A, B, C. And they'll sort of like walk you through um, uh, very clear cut expectations of what they're looking for in a project. And they're usually looking for a list of log lines or very, very short synopses like 100, 200 words. And that's usually done by email, honestly. When you do secure the meeting, and in today's world, it's almost usually Zoom or some kind of a teleconference, um, you just sort of walk through those ideas a bit. Um, but it's really much more about sussing out who you are, um, what you bring to the table, how many variations of the same thing you can sort of deliver upon uh, in the hopes of maybe not just doing a one-time deal, but actually building more of a relationship and a partnership so that you can sort of get repeat business uh, with a client. So you've already been vetted before you're doing a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not just a blind pitch where someone wants to do their sort of um, hometown story and they don't really know the person. You, they've kind of gone through the proper channels. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's to get that meeting, the process to sort of reach that, you know, it's if you find a company that's willing to, to look at content from new people, that's pretty critical. Um, so it, that can be, you can reach out to people via LinkedIn, you can reach out to them you know, online, you can, you can do enough research and find their contact details, or at least some general you know, info at XYZ company kind of uh, uh, email someplace. And those will actually get reviewed and read. Um, I'm not saying there's a real high turnover in that, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, people do evaluate that. And if there is something there that sort of matches a general sort of feel of what the company looks for, if it sort of matches the brand and what that company delivers to the market, um, yeah, you usually will have somebody reach out. And it's, it's not just one script. They're looking for people who sort of can deliver um, a, a high output. Somebody who's coming to the table not just with like one screenplay and that's what they have. They want somebody who has three screenplays or five screenplays. Not that they'd read them all, but they just sort of want to know that this is a writer who's, who can deliver, who is kind of a writing machine, so to speak, and can just keep getting new versions, as I said, sort of of the same thing, of the same kind of genre out there. What's the bare minimum experience someone has to have to pitch in Hollywood? You need to be able to show that you've sort of done the work in a sense. Um, the catch 22 when starting out, for anybody starting out in a career, is you have zero professional experience, but the people on the other side of the table want to see that you've done something. They'll look you up on IMDb, they'll look you up uh, uh, your general sort of online presence to get a sense of who you are. And if you're trying to break into writing or something creative, it's actually quite challenging because if you don't have those credits in place, sort of how do you prove that? Um, what's fun about today, which is very different than 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, is that anybody can kind of create their own website and can sort of present themselves very professionally through any number of social media outlets. So you can sort of create your own personalized brand via website or something else. And even if you have no professional credits, you can sort of showcase some of the um, uh, styles that you work within, some of the writing samples that you have, and sort of present yourself that way. Uh, I think having that sort of presence is a great start. And then I would say you sort of need a, I call it like a critical mass of, of um, materials to be able to show. And that would be like, if you want to be a screenwriter, my personal advice is you need at least two scripts. If not three, that would be the ideal. And you need about five to 10, like ready to go, fleshed out, log line ideas and a log line being, you know, 75 words to 100 words. Concepts that do show that beginning, middle end concept of a movie. And I think that with that, you're sort of coming to the table um, with a good amount of volume and a professional background. That's enough sort of to secure that meeting and sort of get that process going. So if you're going to markets, if you're going and just sort of 
cold emailing people, so to speak. Um, you know, not everyone's going to immediately turn and, and respond right away, but you know, you might get, you know, 15% that do. And if they do, um, they can quickly sort of dive in there and see that, no, this person sort of has potential. Let's see what they can deliver on. Let's see what their log lines are like. Let's see what a synopsis looks like. Maybe they'd be willing to write on spec. And writing on spec in this case would mean, hey, we're doing 20 movies a year and the network will only buy from us if there's a script and we don't want to put out X number of dollars to get a script that may never get greenlit. So what if we worked with a writer on spec? We can get the screenplay for you know, a lower amount up front. And then if the green light takes place, the writer gets the remainder of the money. And it's a great opportunity for, for new writers especially to um, sort of get their foot in the door, really show a track record with uh, a distribution company or production company, multiple, There's, you know, they don't have to be exclusive, and uh, uh, really start you know, kickstarting their career. Okay, and so what if they've, they've done their homework on the production company, they know that they're going to be pitching a similar genre, they have five, let's say, scripts ready to go, they have other ideas, but the thing that's gonna get them is their IMDB only shows like short films, but They've actually done rewrites, but it's not reflected in their IMDb. Because we, we hear that a lot in comments. Well, this person hasn't done anything, but they actually have. It just isn't reflected in their IMDb. How do they, how do they kind of handle that, work around that? I mean, on my side of the industry, I, I work very much on the business side. And um, there's like a fraction of the titles I've actually worked on in a creative capacity, a development capacity, um, a distribution capacity. Uh, I don't have my name on those films. Um, and that's how most of us are on our side, in distribution, in um, development. You know, we don't, we don't get credits all the time. And so uh, you showcase it in other ways, basically. You know, it's, it's much more about the deals I've closed and sort of the contacts that I have. Our business is really built on relationships. Um, so I think that if you're a, a newer writer or somebody who does have experience, it's about cultivating the relationships. Uh, my, my real view, it's, it's like such an old saying, but it's like, it's, it's really, this industry is built on relationships. It's about who you know. Um, that's not enough to just, that's enough to sort of sometimes get a door open, but that's not necessarily going to land the deal or get your first opportunity going. And that's all on your own shoulders. And that's actually, it's a little bit scary in a sense, but in truth, like you have the most control over that because you can come into the room with the right kinds of scripts, with the right sorts of ideas, with the right personal um, presentation in the sense of being a professional and wanting to work and uh, willing to put in the work to get it done. Why do pitch meetings exist in the first place? Executives sort of have this issue where they need lots of stuff to make their jobs functional. Um, and it is impossible for all of those ideas to come from one place. You can't just create all of them in the boardroom. Um, and they need outside influence. They need people who are much more in a creative uh, uh, mindset to be able to sort of like, executives look at these things as problems. It's, it's, you're walking in saying, you know, we need X number of films this year. We need 20 films on our, our calendar for Q4. And that's all they're thinking about is much more just like, what are we going to slate when and where? What are we going to program for this month? What are we going to program for this quarter? And they sort of need, um, we need a lot of assistance in terms of like, okay, what are we going to fill that with? Like, I'm really good at you know, getting a deal together. I can get the financing together. I can create the opportunity of this is the movie we're gonna make. A lot of the deals I do, we're making, we're making movies before the movie exists, before there's a script. It's a concept, but I've closed many, many deals that are just you know, a big contract with financial numbers attached to it and all the titles are to be determined movie number one, number two, number three, and it's a package of films. That's when we go out to creative uh, uh, outlets, whether it's production companies, development executives that we know, screenwriters that we know, and it's much more about like, look, we need some films here, what do you have? Or I set up a deal, or I'm sorry, I set up a meeting with um, a network or a VOD platform, and they wanna know what films we have. And so I will go out to like writers that we work with a lot and sort of say, I'm meeting with this client, you know, what do you have that sort of matches these types of genres? Um, and then I'll just take two or three log lines that they have. 
I'll put them all together and we'll present them and see what sticks, so to speak. And it's sort of pitching is much more about taking the creative aspect of filmmaking or television production or new media in general and making it a business case or taking the business opportunity and adding that splash of creativity to it that makes the whole thing stick together. That's sort of the gist of it. But it's really about like just fielding information so we can close the deal. Will Hollywood always have pitch meetings? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's every industry has pitch meetings. Dating has pitch meetings. It's, it's, um, pitching is really about taking your opportunity as a person and sort of just saying like, this is what I can deliver. This is what I can make happen. It's, um, you have to sort of look, if you just sit around and, and wait for the, you know, proverbial phone call, like it's never going to come, you know, it's, you do have to step out there in the world and sort of create your own opportunities. Opportunities never come in clean, neat packages. They're usually problems. And um, companies have problems all the time. And, you know, it's, it's looking at those and saying, I can find a way in here, get my foot in the door, so to speak, and solve that problem. And I have the talents to do it. And here's how and why. That's all pitching is. It's, it's every industry, every scenario in your life involves a, a deal of pitching. If you're negotiating anything in your life, if you're negotiating, I don't know, with, how you want to decorate your house with your spouse or partner. Like there's, you're pitching ideas and you're presenting concepts and bringing that to the table. But in terms of Hollywood, in terms of the media business, um, that's the only way that you're going to be able to get your ideas heard is by sort of expressing what you think a project could be, how you think it should be executed. And I think what you should also be adding to that is that you're the most important person to deliver it because of, you know, whatever reasons you want to put in there. But that's pitching. It's all just what can you deliver? What can you bring to the table? How can you solve other companies or other people's problems? And that's how you get results. Well, yeah, you always hear about that when, uh, let's say, if you've ever watched any entrepreneurial pitches, a TV show or in live, it's always because someone wanted to solve a problem they had and yeah. they created something for the market. But how does someone know what quote unquote problems are at a, at a production company or a network? that they could be the one to solve that. In truth, there's always a bit of blindness to it. Um, even on my end, where we're meeting with, you know, the heads and the presidents of networks all the time. Uh, and even we are a little bit in the dark to a degree in terms of like, what decisions have they decided behind closed boardroom doors since the last time we chatted with them? Um, but a great way to look at this is uh, if you, most of these companies are like massive publicly traded companies. I'm not an MBA. I'm not like some big business guru. I just kind of like getting movies made and I'm sort of more creative on the deal making side, not on the uh, story side. Um, that's sort of how I look at it. But most of these companies, whether it's Netflix, AMC Networks, Discovery, Paramount, they're all publicly traded. And why that's important is that anybody can get on their website and there's always going to be some tab in there called investors. And if you get on those and you can look for documents called 10 K's or 10 Q's, and these are required by law that they publish these big documents. They're insanely long. They're like 300, 400 pages. You don't have to read them all, but if you actually skim through the first couple of pages, there's usually like a letter from the CEO. There's like a breakdown of the marketplace. There's a breakdown of what they're trying to do in the next year, the next quarter. And they list it all out there. Like they literally tell you like A to B, this is what we're trying to do. This is where we're trying to get to. These are the problems we have. Uh, and this is how we're trying to adapt in this marketplace or be competitive. So they list it all out. And what's also good about those is they actually use their own. Every company has like their own internal language that they use, how they like to talk about problems, how they like to speak about projects, it's all listed in there. So that's a really good resource if you're trying to sort of learn what our company's going for. But truth be told, if you're newer to the industry and you're sort of just starting out, opening those major doors isn't the most likely uh, uh, direct first step. It's usually gonna be smaller companies that feed into those big ones. So it's going to be smaller distribution companies, smaller production companies, 
um, and they're the ones who are actually producing the core content that will then be delivered to those bigger players. So if you are looking at more of the originals that are popping up on a lot of these platforms or networks, uh, and you go look at the companies that are consistently delivering to them, those are the ones to look at. But whatever the big entity problems are, it's also gonna ripple down to the smaller players too. They're sort of like, I, I call them like satellites. Like they're sort of satellite companies and they're always feeding into those big beasts. And so um, whatever the big beast is having an issue with, the smaller companies will be too. But that's a great way to find some interesting opportunities. Wow, that's fascinating. I might just do that just to just to try your example, just because. So go to a publicly traded company and look for investor info, and then kind of it'll be like a PDF or something, and, and see. Yeah, like it, the major companies, you can download it like in any conceivable format, and it's um, you can you can usually search through the document. So if you're looking for something very specific, like certain titles of movies or TV shows, or certain types of platforms that they might work with. Oh. Um, like if you looked into Fox, you know, Tubi is related to Fox, uh, Pluto is related to Paramount. So you can get in there and actually do a bit of research on the specific platform you're looking at. So, yeah. Most screenwriters understand that they should know the ending of their story before they start writing. Can you explain how the same logic applies to understanding the business? Yeah, um, I, that's something I... Uh, had a challenge sort of defining for a while myself. And then um, I realized it's actually a lot simpler than I thought about it. It's just, it's, it's us. It's, it's, we call ourselves end users. We are people who actually pay for content. So if you have a Netflix subscription, you're an end user. If you pay for tickets to a movie, you're an end user. We are the actual audience that's paying money and funding the whole entertainment business. So, Looking at us, what do audiences like? How are we split into groups? What genres um, pop with certain demographics? That is what studios care about. That's what networks care about. That is what um, any sort of consumer, direct to consumer facing company will care about. Uh, so it's sort of the same idea. They are using that information to sort of delineate what content should we go for, what content should we avoid. So if you look at different television channels, they are all targeted to very sort of specific audience categories. They have similar genres. They have very similar themes. Um, and they tend to not they tend to speak to very different groups and they don't have a whole lot of overlap. Um, I think this is probably the most visible with cable news where you see very polarized views of the world um, uh, speaking to very specific audiences and all they care about is speaking to that one target and nobody else. Uh, if a company is releasing the Twilight films, they're doing the same thing. They really want to keep their audience happy so that they can make the second and the third film. If they're doing the Fast and Furious franchise, they really want to keep that audience happy so they can keep sort of churning out one title to the next. So, very long-winded way of answering this, but it's basically, you're, you're correct. If you're going to write a script, you have to know how it ends because you structure everything leading up to it. When we're doing distribution deals, when I'm sort of getting films financed, or getting television shows off the ground, we are thinking the exact same way, but our sort of, how are we gonna make this work? We're looking at an audience. We're looking at a company that speaks to that audience because most of what I do works in what we call like the B2B or business to business end of things. Um, I'm doing deals directly with the studios or I'm doing deals directly with um, other entities that are direct to consumer. So television channels or VOD platforms, et cetera. They care about their audience. They want content that's gonna keep their audience happy and engaged and watching. I need to give them content that's going to ensure that that takes place. So I'm absolutely using the metrics, the data, the information I can gather or that they can share with me about who their audience is, what they like, how they like content to feel, how they like it to be structured, how they like it to flow, and then I work backwards and those are the kinds of films we look for. Those are the kinds of screenplays we try to find. We try to find writers who can sort of deliver in that world. And that's sort of what keeps that supply chain going. What else do writers need to know about the traditional script to screen mode of thinking? 
Uh, I would reverse it. Um, it's, I, I think when you're starting out, it's, it's look, whatever is gonna get a couple scripts like under your belt, so to speak, like follow it. But um, once you sort of get a much better command of your craft, you have the confidence that you can write feature length scripts with relative ease. It's not easy at all, but I mean, the fact that you know you can do it, once you sort of reach that point, you need to sort of stop thinking about the script to screen approach and start thinking about what do screens need and then write that because that's how our industry really operates. It's, it's, if you look at the Cannes Film Festival or the Berlin Film Festival, a lot of people have a mindset that the film gets made and then you take it to the festival and then sort of present it to the world with the hope of getting distribution. And it's like, no, the distribution was set up before the film was even shot. That's a big marketing stunt. That's just getting it out there and showing people like, look how great this movie is. We won awards, etc. Um, maybe very small independent films go to the markets uh, and haven't yet secured distribution. But the big ones, they're already taken and they're locked. Um, and you sort of have to think about screenwriting the same way. You need to approach it as what do these television channels need? What do these outlets need? Um, what are the core genres that make that work? Uh, I've, I wrote about that years and years ago in, in my first book and it was, those have not changed. Like, Christmas movies, they make hundreds every single year. It's like Christmas is coming this year and I guarantee you it's gonna come next year too. And there's gonna be a big content need and a lot of networks and a lot of TV channels all over the world um, really bank on that. Action films with aging male heroes, you can shoot them very economically and you can get all kinds of known talent um, who can be in those films. You can shoot them for a day or two and you have this big celebrity you have on the poster. Uh, but those same scripts, they work at very low budget levels, but they also work at much bigger budget levels. The genre is what's important. I wouldn't do a horror film, but you could do a creature feature, something with some kind of a tangible visual thing and not just sort of the standard issue sort of slasher film. And then I'm, I'm personally a big fan of like tween girl romance films. Those do extraordinarily well, both as movies and as well as TV series. Uh, there's a lot of latitude in those genres you can work in. So those are the things that I think writers need to think about is these are the genres that are gonna sell. Um, I call them goldmine genres. That's not like an industry term, but it's uh, uh, those are the genres that sell. So if you're writing in those buckets, uh, you're writing what the industry depends on through good times, bad times, inflation, non-inflation periods, and uh, that's what the industry builds itself on. And forgive me, why not horror? Horror is just, horror and comedy are just really, really, really hard to pull off. I, I call these latitudes of failure, which again is not like an industry term, it's just something I made up, but it's, um, it's like, if you're gonna write something or shoot something, if you're gonna make a movie on spec, whatever it is, there are certain genres that like, you gotta nail it or it's just a dud. And a comedy or a horror film, if you have like, if it's 99% on point, but there's like one or two things in it that aren't ideal, uh, it just like loses interest or it loses market placement opportunities. Whereas if you have a family movie that's very family safe, uh, if you have a Christmas romance movie with a dog in it, or like, a tween girl and a horse movie, any of these that like aren't perfectly executed or there's like maybe not the best coverage of a scene, um, they still get bought and they still get picked up and you can shoot them on very low budgets and even if they don't come out perfectly like there's an audience for it because television networks and VOD platforms around the world love that stuff. They're advertiser safe. They're, um, they're very family co-viewing friendly. Uh, I mean, Christmas movies are a good example. I don't think many people actually watch them, but they're just like background fill and people like to have them on. And so there's not a whole lot of dedication to the viewership of them outside of a select group of people. So it's, um, but networks love them because they really turn in the ratings. So that's the kind of thinking you have to have is if you're going for a genre like comedy or horror, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying like, work on it, but maybe don't have it be your out of the gate project that you're trying to sort of get an agent with. There's always outliers, of course. There's always examples people can cite of like, 
well, this person did it and that person did it. It's like, yeah, they did, but the vast majority of people, that's not gonna be the path they follow. From your first book, Writing for the Green Light, you talk about how so many screenwriters devour screenwriting books and they learn structure and format, but they don't learn what to do once they've finished that screenplay. Yeah, it's, it's that used to drive me nuts. I would say that book specifically, I wrote it because um, it, it was the book that like was never written that I always wish sort of existed in some capacity. Uh, most of those books, like I think, what was it, Sid Field who wrote, he wrote screenplay. It was like, that was the one that really kickstarted the whole three act structure. It was this amazing book about how to structure a script and how to like organize ideas. And I know there's some outdated things in it today, but like at the very end of it, there's like five pages, and that's an exaggeration, but there's like this like very thin chapter at the end that's just like, oh yeah, you know, and go get an agent and do those. Things. And it's like, they'll take care of it. I guess that's the critical thing is a lot of people write a script uh, and they just sort of expect that that's all they need to do. And um, somebody else will sort of carry it from there. And getting an agent or a manager isn't necessarily the answer to that problem. Agents and managers are great. I don't think you actually need one when you're starting out. Uh, that's my personal opinion. That's not like advice, but it's, it's um, my personal opinion is I work with writers who don't have agents all the time. They manage themselves. Um, they uh, are able to just sort of um, present themselves well and use their own ability to get the door open, so to speak. They have a great personal branding that they've done on their own online. Um, they're extraordinarily professional. They uh, make opportunities happen for themselves because they go out there and they cold email, they cold call, and they initiate opportunities for themselves. Um, they're willing to showcase their work uh, before just demanding that they get paid up front when we've never done business before. Obviously, everybody gets paid for their work, but it's, it's sort of um, sometimes you have to show your goods in order to showcase like I'm the real deal and I can, I can do this. Uh, so that's, you know, I, I guess overall that's sort of the, the general kind of flow is you have to be able to um, do it on your own. You have to be able to get your talents presented uh, on your own. And is that how they reach your door, so to speak, is through a cold email? I mean, that's one way to do it. I mean, it's, it's, I've, I've, personally, I've, I've worked with people who are referred. I've worked with people, yeah, who've, who've shown up uh, um, via email, via LinkedIn, via any number of sources, who've just reached out to us uh, 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 sort of directly just saying like, look, I've, I've written romance books and I'd like to write movies or I've written a ton of movies and I'd like to keep that going. And you know, they just sort of, yeah, approach it that way. It's, it's the answer is it, it, ultimately, yes, it's, they're just reaching out blindly. They're reaching out blindly, but it's not like they're reaching out with random projects. They're reaching out with projects that sort of fit our core expectation, what we work with. Uh, and they um, are just sort of showcasing like, look, this is what I do. I have these scripts. Will you take a look at them? Can we do something? And we've hired a lot of writers that way. And they are realistic that like the first log line they present isn't going to turn into a green light. Like it does sort of have to build a bit in terms of the relationship. So that's a real old style of thinking maybe that I need this agent or manager to walk me through the door. Yeah, look, a lot, I mean, Again, this is my personal opinion, so I mean, I, I'm not, uh, full disclosure, like I'm not giving sure, career sure. advice. It's just <laughs> in a general sense, it's like, um, you have to think about what do agents actually do. Agents are actually in the business of blocking opportunities by putting up a paywall. So they are restricting your access in a way and trying to get the highest price possible. They're not out there trying to make sure that every one of their writers are constantly getting work. They'll sign a group of writers, and then if two out of 10 are like, hey, people really like their work, they're gonna put all their attention on those two out of 10. And they're gonna make sure that those deals are really, really successful in those. And they'll let the others, you know, if you are generate, look, I know a lot of writers who have written independently, and then they go get an agent. Their agent, I call, you know, they, they get involved and they start 
hiking prices to unrealistic levels, and then we just sort of stop working with them because the price expectations no longer match the budget where we're working. We're not saying that they're not talented and that you know you shouldn't expect reasonable compensation for your efforts, but you can't go from like here to there in terms of pricing overnight just because you sign somebody and they want their 15% or whatever. It just doesn't realistically work that way. So those writers we've actually stopped working with. We've had other writers who've got an agent and then they got rid of their agent and they said, you know what, I'm just gonna do it independently. Because I was out there getting my own deals, creating my own opportunities. I was making, you know, writing five, six, seven movies a year at this price point. Why should I give this agent, you know, X percentage for just basically having their name on my screenplay when they did nothing? They didn't initiate the work. They didn't initiate the opportunity. They didn't close the deal. So we've had a lot of writers who actually have stepped away from their agents and come over and just manage themselves. They just have a website, uh, uh, their own uh, social media outlets, and they just sort of initiate the deals on their own. They go to the markets by themselves, et cetera. Right, so similar to actors who say, you know, my agent's not getting me any work, and you know, but they weren't maybe doing things behind the scenes to get work. You know? Correct, yeah, look, I mean, like it's, it's the frustrating reality of any industry, like it's not isolated to Hollywood. It's, it's, it, we just know it, it's easier to see here because you know, it's, it's, it's a creative driven industry, et cetera. But it's like, uh, if you are writing a script and you want to get your script in front of people, you have to do it yourself. Just because you wrote it and it's sitting there as a PDF on your computer, uh, that's not going to get an offer presented to you by email. It's, it's you have to go put it out there. And then the first thing people are gonna do is find every reason in the world why they shouldn't read your script. Because they got 50 scripts to read that week. And they are, if, if, if you don't have that online presence, if you don't have a personal relationship, if you haven't been referred to them, or if you haven't present, if, if you write a blind email, but you present yourself well, you explain why you wrote what you wrote, um, that can get attention. Like, the company I'm working for now, uh, we produce very specific types of films. We do Christmas romance films. We do really cozy female driven romances in really beautiful, gorgeous locations, like very clear cut kind of movies. And so if somebody's pitching, you know, some horror film or some avant garde coming of age story, like we're not going to look at it. It just doesn't fit what we need. We're looking for stuff that's gonna keep our pipeline going. But when people come out and they're like, hey, I can write Christmas romances, and I have, here's a script and 10 log lines of Christmas romances. We'll take a look at it. And we've actually bought a few of those. And then you have a few, you said women in peril. So like these thrillers, I saw one like, some kind of cyber stalking or something. Yeah, yeah, we do, we do women in peril thrillers as well. Like very lifetimey kind of films. Um, they're, we don't do as many of those. Like I would say probably like 55, 60% of our output right now is like Christmas romance movies. It's a wonderful bread and butter sure, sure. vertical. Yeah. I, I love what you said too about just some people just want to have them on in the background. Yeah. And, and I think that's very true. And it, it lends to the season. Like if you want to feel the season, having it on in the background, it, the plot doesn't even matter at times. Oh, it's just, yeah. <laughs> I mean... It, it just, it the feels plots like are kind Christmas. of recycled a bit it, too, right. but uh, yeah, it's it, but it's kind of like that Yuletide log, you know, when it was just like an hour video of a fireplace burning, you know, and it was just uh, people would put it on the TV and it had the crackle pop sound and the visual, and it felt like the holidays. And yes, that's absolutely transferred into the holiday films. It's I've been doing I've been in the TV movie world for over ten years, and that's never changed. The, the volume of content has actually gotten bigger. When being pitched, every executive has this question. Why am I looking at this? Yeah. It's, uh, uh, there are, I think, a couple of uh, questions that may never be asked that you sort of have to be able to answer with a pitch. Um, and that is definitely one of them. <clears throat> I think that's probably the, the, the most critical first one. It's and it goes back to a lot of the other things we've sort of been discussing. It's executives have very limited time and they have very specific needs that they're looking for. 
Um, they need to find content that's going to fit into very specific slots or buckets, and um, that's what they need to know. Is it going to fit or is it not? And that's really, I think, what the core of that question is. Why am I looking at this? Does it work for us? Does it fit? Is it in the price point? Can we utilize it? Can we make it something into an even bigger opportunity, etc.? But yeah, they want to know how is this serving what we're trying to do? And should the writer then try to put themselves in that executive's shoes and question why would they want to look at this? Or writers blind to that because they think that their material is, is the answer? I mean, should we kind of question why would this executive meet with me? I think if, if you have an opportunity to meet with production company executive, distribution executive, anyone in that world, um, I wouldn't question it. I, I would just sort of utilize it as an opportunity of how, how can my, what, what, what can I do with my talents and help serve what you're trying to do in a way. The uh, reason I say that is not to in any way not be true to what you want to write or what you want to create, but more, what do I have to do to make my script work for what you're trying to achieve here? Or what can I write to help you know, your company mandate or, or expectation of growth? Um, you got to think of like businesses sort of like systems. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a collection of small things that they're all trying to do in order to like just grow, grow, grow. They need films, they have money to spend, and they have to spend it on movies. They have to spend it on movies that are already completed. They have to spend it on movies that are not yet completed but are in development so that they can satisfy their client base. So they have deep pockets, not, you know, not bottomless pockets, but they do have money to spend. And they're only going to spend it on so many movies. What you need to do is really figure out, okay, if you're only going to spend it on so many movies, how can I make mine be the one that's going to work? And having an, a mindset of like zero concessions and not being a team player is not going to make that happen. But being able to say, here's a couple of ideas, do one of these resonate? And then if it can, you know, sort of be tweaked and you know, molded a bit and, and pruned here and there, um, then it can sort of start to fit into something that will work not just for the distribution company, but their client who's trying to feed into an audience or an end user. Would you say most of the writers that reach out to you without representation, they've researched the genres that they should be pitching you? It's not like it's a total non-match. Uh, it's In truth, it's probably more like 50-50. Um, and... If, if, I'm, if our company is getting, I don't know, 50 emails, let's say, and 25 are just like, I'm, I wrote a script about XYZ that has nothing to do with what you guys do, um, you know, we'll just politely decline before we even, we'll just, we'll just say no. And that's, that's assuming, you know, we, you know, it's, yeah, it's usually just kind of a, it's not going to work for us. We, it, you know, it's, we're, not, we're not in that business. Um, but if it is something that is sort of dabbling into the world where we work, we'll take a look at it. Now, taking a look at it doesn't mean that we're going to buy it or, or do business together in the immediate future, but it is an opportunity to sort of plant a seed and, and figure something out down the road. But yeah, I mean, we've, we've worked with writers who've reached out to us blindly and their initial scripts, none of them were that first thing that got made. But it showed us, like, okay, this person actually knows how to write the genre well. And then uh, when an opportunity comes up, we have reached out to them and said, like, would you write this? And they say, yes, we do our deal, and they get paid, we deliver the script, everyone's happy. And we've done that with a couple writers. And then there's a few others that, um, you know, we're on good relations with, where we, they have the right scripts, but um, we just haven't found that project yet to work on together. Uh, but I know that we will because it's just we have already established that sort of communication. And it's just a matter of time till we sort of figure out like, okay, this will work really well for that writer. Because every writer has their own style too. What is a verifiable audience? Um, verifiable audience is something that it's, it's a way of describing a guaranteed viewer of content. Um, 
a legitimate audience of people out there that you can sort of bank on or project upon. So what I mean by that is like if you have a book, um, whomever purchased the book would be a verifiable audience. Those are people out there who actually transacted on it, they bought it, uh, so they must have had some kind of interest in it, and if you were to make a movie on that book, you could use that verifiable audience to sort of project the types of viewers you would likely have or the types of outlets you could likely go to. It's also, if you think about, you know, ratings systems uh, in terms of uh, viewership metrics, that would also be verifiable audience. It's sort of people who uh, uh, are actually interacting with your content, engaging with it. Um, you're able to sort of look at that audience as a core, define who they are, and uh, be able to sort of say, if we're going to be making a project like this or in this space, who would our verifiable audience be to reach out to? Now in a pitch capacity, if you are trying to sort of bring an idea to the table to pitch it, um, you would need to showcase that your projects have a verifiable audience. This is, I think, where it gets a little bit wonky for people who are sort of new to the industry because they love to sort of take outlier projects, um, meaning examples of movies from the past that were extremely successful uh, and, you know, that were sort of not representative of the average, but sort of like those mega hits that were like unexpected big hit films or TV shows or whatever. Um, those are the ones they like to quote a lot. But verifiable audience is actually more of the sort of boring average. It's sort of the predictable um, expectation. I think the thing people talk about with Star Wars, for instance, the original one way back in the 70s, um, George Lucas said, I'm getting my numbers wrong. I haven't thought about this example in over a decade, but it's, I think he was saying at the time, an average movie of that style made about 15, 16 million dollars at the box office. So if they could make their movie at around 10 million, they, it was gonna be a success. Obviously, like the massive success of that and what it launched was never expected by anybody. I don't even think by George Lucas himself, but that kind of thinking that if we make the move, if there's an audience that repeatedly watches this kind of content, what money does that generate? How do we quantify that? Um, where do they watch it? And how do we calculate that out? And then if you find that average, you can sort of work your way backwards to, okay, well then what movie do we need to make? How much does it need to cost? What kind of cast do we need to populate it with? And that's sort of the process. How does a beginning writer know their story has a verifiable audience? I think if you're working with an original story idea, um, it's, it's sticking to those sort of gold miner core genres I talk about a lot because those are sort of the tried and tested and proven, you know, buckets of programming that are always in need. Uh, so if you are writing a movie in that space, whether it's a tween girl romance or, you know, a female driven thriller, um, one of those titles, one of those projects, you know you're speaking to a core group of, of a core demographic, I'll say, of audience that likes and responds to that. It resonates with them. Uh, now, there's so many granular sort of details within all that, um, but that's sort of the beginning point, is if you're sticking to a core genre or a goldmine genre, then at least you know you're sort of in the right building, so to speak. Uh, as you get deeper into it, um, I'm not saying write cliches. I'm obviously I'm very against cliches, but it's it's you do need to use you need to be very true to what that genre is. Um, so if that's certain types of character combinations, if that's certain types of story arcs, um, that I think is really those are sort of the the metrics of am I sort of in the right zone here? And if you have that down. Uh, I think you're sort of in the right ballpark, so to speak. That's if you're just doing it totally original work. That's and you're starting from the very beginning of I'm going to create a story here. I'd follow that mindset of work backwards. What does the industry need? What do television channels need? What do VOD platforms need? 
and what is going to help them grow audience and sustain it. Uh, and think about it at an independent level, not at big mega million per episode or, or, or you know, multi-million dollar film level. I'm thinking more like smaller scale, low budget movie, under two million budget. Um, if you're thinking more at that scale, that's where the real volume is that a lot of companies work within. That represents the vast majority of what gets produced every single year on a global basis. Um, and if you're sort of working in that and you're working in the core genres, uh, you're sort of feeding into that pipeline of what's needed. Can you give me some examples of a cliche? A couple of cliches that... Uh... Uh, the truth is, like, you just sort of know them when you see them. It's the, it's the expected. It's the, it's the... I mean, there's so many jokes. I mean, look, I, I work in Christmas movies. Like, it's so many jokes about, you know... Big city girl who, uh, uh, you know, just is having a tough time in the city on her own. Her perfect life uh, doesn't work, so she goes back to her small town. You know, these are the, that's your cliche. And then, of course, she reunites with so-and-so who she used to know as a kid. And then there's some friction. And then, like, you know, they hit it off in the end and everything's perfect. And it's a perfect Christmas. And so for, like, a Christmas romance... Um, that is sort of the cliche of the storyline, but that structure does work. So you have to find your differences within that structure. And this is, this is actually where the talent of writing comes in, where it's, it's so easy to like poke fun at that and say, anybody can write those things. Anybody can write a tween girl romance film. Anybody can write a girl in a horse film. Try it. Do it. Like, it's, it's harder than it looks. And um, the amount of creative meetings I've had on that storyline, on how to make it different, how to make it unique, how to maintain an audience that needs to see that, but keep them engaged so they don't feel like they're seeing the same thing they've already seen. It's a lot harder than it looks. And there's a lot more involved development discussions and creative meetings than you would ever expect. From the very beginning, all the way through pre-production, all the way through the editing process. So it's, it's when you're trying to reach a core verifiable audience, it's going back to Christmas movies because it's an obvious one. There's hundreds that get made every single year. Like you're speaking to an audience, like there's a verifiable audience and there's metrics from Lifetime and Hallmark and all of them that, you know, they make a certain number of films every single year. Um, and it goes back to how do you get your foot in the door? Well, you think about if they're going to spend all this money, which they're going to, I guarantee you, they're already working on their 2024 slates. Um, how do you augment your work so that you're the one they spend money on? And it's sort of looking at that and saying, all right, that's the tried and tested expectation. That's the genre. There's clearly a verifiable audience for it. Now, how do I find those subtle differences that make the structure work uh, that, that aren't the same old boring cliche? It's, it's, it's the classic, like the same thing, only different. Yeah, because I've noticed that a lot of these films, and I think this works, it's somebody returns back to the small hometown. Mm -hmm. And they're either met with open arms or met with resistance. But there's something about that that seems like it's satisfying to viewers. Yeah, yeah. And look, we, uh, we've done it the other way. We've had the small town go to the big city. We've had the whole thing take place in the big city. We've had the whole thing take place in a small town. We've had it be that um, it's, it's the lead characters dealing with a loss. They lost a, a, a spouse or a mother or somebody who was very close to them. And so they are feeling that separation, but it's emotional instead of like physical. We, uh, we, we, we're just doing a movie now. Um, we just wrapped on it. And it's about somebody who returns home, but not because she wants to. She's doing it because she's basically uh, at a crossroads with her job. And she's going to go home to her small town and actually um, exploit something about her small town for work to return to the big city. Her intention is to go back to the big city, and she's just utilizing the opportunity to go there and do something. But of course, while she's there, she realizes that she can't do this and everything's happy in the end. But um, it's the intention was very, very different than the same old like. It's, so I guess that motivation of how do you end up from point A to point B? That's, it's those subtle things that sort of make a script or a story pop. And it's a writer who can deliver unique variations of that um, very consistently. But like, you know, bring something new to the table that fits the mold every time. That's sort of how it works. Sure. And, and it seems like those genres also uh, transcend different age groups as well. They certainly do. They certainly do. Um, I think mysteries is sort of a good one. That would fall more into like your 
female-driven thriller. But uh, mysteries can can really be, you know, you can have your old lady mysteries, you can have your, you know, young, fresh audience mysteries. There's a whole series of books that are aimed at tween readers that are mysteries. Um, so that's definitely a genre that sort of satisfies a very wide spectrum, but you can have subgenres within it that sort of focus on one demographic at a time, yeah. You believe there are seven core principles to pitching? Yeah, and uh, I like to use the word principle instead of rules because uh, truth is like, I mean, you can see in the past like 15 years, uh, in the past three years in, in terms of how things have worked, uh, just how things, technology, interactions, the way we engage with content, that changes all the time. Uh, but the core principles behind how things function, those never change. So I like to work with principles, yeah. But I, I, I've identified seven that I think are just sort of true and consistent, the same today as they were back in Shakespeare's time period of, of how do you pitch a story idea and get the thing rolling. Well, it looks like the first one is selling. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think sales has a really negative word or connotation, I should say, to it. But um, you have to sell yourself if you want to pitch your idea. Um, we talked about it before. You can, you can write a great script, but if it just sits on your desktop, uh, on your laptop, like no one's going to see it. You need to be able to pitch yourself. You need to be able to pitch why it's worth reading. You need to get it to the right people. Not get it to everybody, not do a mass email, but um, find the right people, the right companies that would resonate with it and sell yourself and sell your idea. Number two, pitching is listening? Pitching is listening, yes. Um, I, most of my pitch meetings, because I pitch too, you know, I'm, I'm pitching business to business. So I'm pitching a business opportunity of how can we get a film made? How can we get a TV series made? In order for me to get that order out of the client, I need to listen to what they want. They need to tell me, um, either they need to tell me or I need to do the research and find out what is it that they need? What are they looking for? What is their company on the hunt for? And I have to showcase why we're the best ones to deliver it. And if you're pitching your ideas, uh, your stack of, of, of 100 pages of script, like that doesn't change in the middle of that meeting, but how you talk about it can. So if um, you're dealing with a client and they start presenting or discussing or describing content in a specific way, listening to that, listening to how they talk about content, listening to what it is that they really need is your way to uh, transition a, a meeting into an opportunity for yourself. So yeah, it's, people will tell you exactly what they need. They'll tell you exactly what they want and there's no shortage of information out there in terms of being able to at least get a pretty solid idea of how to position yourself. What if they're so nervous that they can't listen because they're so worried about, will this turn out? Do they like my work? Whatever it is. Look, it's, it's, it can be nerve wracking in a sense. Look, I would say this actually. It can be nerve wracking when you're not used to it um, it can be nerve wracking when you have built this idea of what pitching must be like versus how it actually is. Um, I think most people envision, uh, you know, an entourage, scary boardroom situation of, you know, six, seven, eight expensive suit people staring at you with like cold faces and, um, I'm not saying I haven't had that experience, but like for the most part, pitching is actually pretty easy going. You're meeting somebody over coffee. You're having just a, a quick chat over a Zoom or you know a, a Google meeting, um, phone call. That's how most pitching is actually done. Most pitching is done by email. And if you are uncomfortable, um, you can take as much time as you need to craft a good email. Uh, and if you can target it well and you don't write it too long, you know, you can actually sort of pitch quite well that way. But you always want to make it more that, look, I'm starting this idea, but I'm really here to work for you. What do you need as a company? Because I can deliver it. And that's sort of the opportunity to get that feedback loop of we need X, Y, Z, and uh, we need writers who can work in this capacity. And excuse me, how long is too long? For an email? Uh, you know, they've actually done studies on this. I'm sure there's some analysis somewhere. Um, but, and I think there's actually like studies about how long you should, I think it's like 
27 characters for a subject line, so it can be read entirely on an iPhone. Uh, but anyway, that's a whole long-winded way. That's no, fascinating. I, I would say like four paragraphs of like two sentences each is like the max for an email. And it's got to sort of be, you're presenting everything you got, you know, the, the five W's, who, what, where, when, why. It's you're saying, this is who I am, this is the script I have, and you got to make it as easy for your client as possible. When I'm pitching movies, they're finished movies, but when I'm pitching movies um, to buyers internationally or here in the States, like I make it as easy for them as possible because they're busy. And it's not that they're rude, it's not that they're, you know, it's just that they're busy. So the easier I can make it, the better. Um, you're presenting yourself, you know, you want to talk about yourself. It's not, don't just dive in with screenplay is X, Y, Z, da, 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 this is the concept. It's much more like, you know, you've showcased that you've actually like done your research and that you're presenting yourself. And by the way, you have this script too, and you'd like to start a conversation about writing. You know, it's, it's not like buy this script right now. It's much more I, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm trying to look for uh, opportunities. What you're writing, I'm sorry, what you're producing is very much in sync with what I'm writing. I have a couple of log lines. I'd love to share them with you if, uh, uh, you know, we can chat sometime. It's, it's very casual. Number three, presentation matters. Absolutely. Um, most of the deals I have secured, it's uh, what I do in the industry, I'm selling things that don't exist. I'm going into uh, a television network or working with a VOD platform, and I am selling, as I said, a lot of the deals I do, the contract is literally like title to be determined. We have no idea what the movie is. We're selling that we're gonna make a movie. And sometimes it'll be like to be determined Christmas movie or to be determined thriller, but we don't know what the movie is. Um, so in order to get that, I have to present in the best possible manner uh, what it is that I'm going to deliver upon. Um, so if you are doing that, so I mean, I'll, I'll create like really nice pitch decks. I'll spend a lot of time on them. Um, I'll, I'll source images from places like Canva or Pexel or other, or other spots. And they have these amazing resources of photos you can use and you can build presentations. Our whole industry, and I think in a visual minded sense, a, a lot of those on the creative side in our industry are very visual thinking. So being able to express their ideas in a visual way, I think is important. Uh, and they also get to do that if they're doing like a personal branding website. But that's sort of the thing I guess I'm talking about is if, if, an, if a name pops up uh, in an email, um, in somebody's email box, like before you hit reply, you're gonna like Google them. Is this person legit? Is this spam? Is this this? Is this that? And um, looking if they have a website, if they if they don't have credits, that's okay. Uh, but it, it's like if they have a website and you can see like this is a real person and they seem to be very professional and they seem to sort of like be reasonable in how they're functioning in terms of what their expectations are, yeah, you will probably reach out. You don't wanna lose an opportunity. Um, and presentation matters in the sense of how you dress. How do you present yourself? How, what is your etiquette when you're on the phone or, or via email? Are you clear and do you, do you express yourself clearly? Or, or are you one of these people who just like has really choppy, vague emails and people aren't really sure what to make of them? Um, do you overextend the opportunity and, and reach too far too quickly? Um, it's, it's those are kinds of the things about presentation matters. But I think website, visual, what can you do? Is a lot of that is in your own control too. And I think that's actually something that's good. I'm just curious, what would an example be of overextending? Oh, like like 9,000 emails a day or, you know, way too many text messages. I mean, I have people who like send me like 15 text messages in a row. Like it's like my phone just vibrates for a good like 12 seconds and I know who it is. You know, it's, uh, it's people like that. That's a little bit overreaching. Too many phone calls. But the occasional like check in is totally fine and you should check in and, and like keep up on things. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think basic etiquette understanding. So maybe the understanding, realizing that you're not the only person they're working with. I know it's hard when it comes to your personal matter or project, but realizing this person might be dealing with a hundred emails that day. Yeah, it's, it's for sure. And look, I mean, 100 is a good day. Like I, I get way more than that. And um, you can't read them all. You can't read them all. So you do have to like 
make decisions of like, what am I going to actually focus on today? And getting to some of those kinds of emails that are more like the blind cold call, cold email kind of things, it is at the bottom of the list, but it does get addressed. And so that's why it's so important. Like if you've got that much time and that much attention from somebody, you got to make sure you're, you're getting everything right. That's presentation, that you've done your research, that you're presenting stuff that actually resonates, you know, and it's, it's, that's sort of where all that falls into. And yeah, I think it's, it's really critical to remember that when you're reaching out to someone, and I, I remind myself of this too, because like, it'll go weeks and I won't hear back from clients. And, um, you know, you sort of do question like, you know, what, what went wrong? And the truth is they're busy. They're really busy they, and they have personal lives. I have a personal life, I have a family. You know, it's, it's, um, that does eat into the equation too in terms of time. Number four, pitching is re-pitching? Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's not like you pitch once and then everything just falls into place. It's, um, you will pitch your idea at log line stage. And if you're fortunate enough to get um, a writer for hire agreement, you'll re-pitch the ideas you put in the treatment. You'll have to re-pitch at script, at script stage. You'll have to, once the script is acquired, I have to go pitch people. I have to go pitch people to get the project funded. We have to go pitch it to talent and, and explain to them why they would want to be in this film. You would think that, you know, actors would be jumping up and down to be in movies, but it's like um, sometimes they are so busy with projects, you also have to pitch like, look, if you can only do seven films this year, this should be one of them and here's why. And it's, it's a constant thing. When we're marketing our films, that's a pitch. A, a trailer of a movie is a pitch. It's pitching you saying, you only have so much time this evening to watch a television show or a movie. Make it ours. Pluto TV, uh, Tubi TV, Netflix, they're pitching you too. And they're saying, if you only are gonna watch content on one platform tonight, make it us. That, it, that, that's the whole process of repitching. It's, it's not like you do it once and it's done. If you take a film like Chinatown, which just for some reason is just constantly said is like the best script ever written. And it's like, that's not actually what it was when they filmed the movie. That's what it ended up being in the end. Um, but you know, at, at script stage that had to get, you know, that had to go through a lot of layers before it finally turned out the other side at the end, the way it did. And a lot of that also happened on set, in the editing room, and just, you know, uh, 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 concessions they had to make in post and all that. So it's, it's that sort of the thinking, is that a script is never done until the movie is released. That's sort of my view of it. Number five, pitching is a slow process? Yes, it's a very slow process. It does not happen overnight. I'm, I'm talking to clients. It's, it's right now, it's March 2023 when we're filming this. I'm pitching clients, you know, uh, 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 18 months in advance in the sense of I'm trying to, to guarantee slates that are next year or even early 2025. Um, it's, it's a slow process in the sense of you may have to pitch a client and then repitch them and then repitch them and then repitch them market after market, quarter after quarter, quarter. I try to get um, usually quarterly calls or like, you know, six month calls with some of my key clients just to keep them up to speed of what we're doing and what we can bring to the table. Um, and yeah, we, we are constantly representing sometimes the same stuff in those meetings. Uh, I would say on average, like to get a movie, like a low budget movie, anything under two and a half million, um, that can be, kind of quick, you could do that maybe in six months, like concept to green light. But if you're talking television, like a whole series, that's at least an 18 month process, if not two years. And that's planting the seed of the idea. And then like, this is why I always focus so much on principles over trends, because there are trends. There are things that are like super popular today. And then you'll get a flood of emails from writers who like, I stayed up all night and wrote this movie because this is like the hot new thing. And it's like, it's gonna take like six months to get this funded, shot, delivered, released. Uh, by that time, that trend is gone. Nobody cares about it anymore. So it's, it's TV shows that come out and they're extremely like relevant or everyone's talking about it. They were just really good quality programs, but they were being developed, you know, 18 months, two years uh, uh, beforehand. I mean, Queen's Gambit is like the best example. 
I don't know the exact dates of that one, but I want to say it was like the 90s, the early, like they started, they greenlit, I'm sorry, they acquired the book rights before the lead actress was even born. Like that's how long that was in that development hell process. It's a very slow process. And the truth is, you got to keep a lot of pots boiling at once on the back burner. You know, if I'm dealing with a client and they need six films this year, I may have 18 to 20 projects we're keeping warm because we don't know exactly which one they're going to go with. And then they pick them very quick. And then all of a sudden you're off to the races. But yeah, that, that process in between can be a very long drawn out time period. Number six, pitching is a lot like dating. Yes, this is, this is a, I adamantly believe that business in general is a lot like dating. It's, um, you use the exact same protocols. You are putting yourself out there. You have kind of a, a clear understanding of what you're trying to achieve, and there's no exact one way to get from beginning to end, so to speak. Um, you do have to, presentation matters. You do have to sort of pitch and present who you are. You have to sort of showcase why you're worth dating. Uh, you have to bring all that to the table. You have to be willing to go out and accept that some people are gonna say no, and they were gonna say no no matter what you said. Uh, you're just not compatible. The chemistry isn't right. And then the whole process of how do you communicate? Um, you know, you don't want to over communicate. You don't want to write too many crazy emails. You don't want to text too much. You don't want to call inappropriate numbers of times or leave 50 voicemails. All of those little sort of nuances, I think, are just true of human behavior in general. You, there's sort of an, a social understanding of this is an acceptable mode of how we're communicating. Uh, and then there's kind of a, a, a totally unwritten line that you sort of instinctually know you shouldn't cross. But unfortunately, a few people do. And uh, uh, that's sort of where that all comes from. So if we took that analogy and said, well, okay, don't talk about your ex on the first date for like over an hour. What would be the same thing for a writer? Maybe don't talk about deals that fell through and trash a studio. Or what would be the same type of thing because that's an equal turnoff, you know? Yeah, I, I would say just in general, don't shit talk anybody. Like, and, and like just, I'm not even gonna say like, it's okay if like the other person brings it up. Like, just don't. Don't be that person. Um, be professional. It's okay that you have a script that, you know, was with another client and maybe they optioned it and then nothing happened with it. That happens and that does not make it like a tarnished property. Um, you can, you can speak openly, but you don't have to like, you know, you don't want to trash talk people and, and fall into that game. Uh, that just because the, the, the question always then ends up being like, well, if things don't work out with us, what are you going to say about us behind our backs? You know, so it's like it kind of makes people kind of want to say, I don't know if I really want to bring this writer in because uh, they what are they going to say if like if, if, if they write a script for us and we pay them and then like all of a sudden the, the network says no to the project and they get the rights to the script back. They've been paid. But, um, you know, these things happen. And so, yeah, if you have writers who sort of like, you know, trash talk people, that does happen. Um, so it's those kinds of things. It's just again, it's like it's it's basic social skills, basic etiquette. Number seven, relationships are everything. Yes, relationships um, really fuel the business. Uh, and that's, I think, the most challenging at first. It feels the most challenging, I would say, if you're new to the industry, um, regardless of what age you are. It's, it's just, uh, if you're new to the industry, it feels like you know nobody. And I would say, like, during the pandemic, this was so powerfully understood because those of us who've been in the industry long enough, you know, 10 years, 15 years, who have real clients that we know and can reach out to, we were fine during the pandemic. We could communicate, we could just reach out and shoot an email or, or a call and it was fine. But if you didn't have those connections, that was such a tough time period and it really kind of created this big gap. Um, and I, I know a lot of younger people who are kind of maybe a year or two behind where they could be because of the pandemic. But um, where do you meet connections and how do you build them? Truth is, you just start. You, don't, you just start one at a time. And it's okay to talk to people and meet with people who 
don't seem to have anything to do with what you do. And in truth, that's where you're going to find your best contacts. Like if you are a writer, it's great to work with other writers and talk to other writers, but at a certain point, like you also need to meet people on the other side of the fence who are more on the business side. Um, and learn what they do and learn how they function in their system so that you can sort of find those opportunities. But uh, it's just a slow process. It's, it's not going to happen overnight. And it's something you just sort of have to make a habit. You have to make a habit of talking to other people. You have to make a habit of communicating well, presenting yourself well all the time. Uh, and it goes back to the whole pitching is like dating. It's like, if you are single, you know, those opportunities can pop up at any time. So you sort of have to always be ready for them, I guess, in a sense. But yeah, it's, it's you need to be able to consistently and regularly be open to the idea of communicating with people who are in the industry, learn what they do, find out how it works in the system. And if you just kind of keep that process going and you stay in relatively reasonable communication with everybody, um, over time, you'll start to find dots to connect. I know that person and they are at that company and I can reach out to them now. And maybe when you first met, that wasn't the case, but you know, 12 months down the line, they got a job opportunity and now it's an in for you. That's how it works. And then once you do work together uh, and you've gotten a job or two in whatever capacity in the industry, you just do the best work you can. And truth is like your reputation does hold. And it's the little things that <clears throat> give people a sense of who you really are. So you gotta give it your all. Do you feel like writers expect things to happen more rapidly as the world has gotten so fast and everything's instantaneous? Have you noticed that or no? That's Yes, uh, I think in general, uh, it's, it's a sense that people have that like things just happen way quicker than they really do. Um, you know, that if you, if you send a script that it's gonna be read that day or the next day, it's like, you know, it may take a month to get it read. Uh, if, if there is a deal to be done, um, that it's gonna happen in a week, and it's like, no, it can take two, three months to negotiate a deal. Uh, so it, it, it just draws out a lot longer on the actual real world professional side, and so that will ripple into buying cycles and scripts. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's being realistic about time expectations is very critical to anyone starting out in the industry in whatever capacity. What is a goldmine genre? It's a phrase I made up, so it's not like, a, it's not like an industry term. But it's, um, uh, it's, I, I call them goldmines because they are just core genres that through good times and bad times have been and as far as I can possibly see, will always be in need year on year in the entertainment industry. So it's just basic buckets of genres that for whatever reason, you know, for the past several hundred years, whether in book form, stage play, and now movies and TV shows, they just hit a certain audience that's large enough to keep momentum moving. So if those genres, if, if they're seen by a distribution company, a production company, a studio, um, they always sort of take them a little bit more seriously than something that doesn't fit easily into that. Uh, and, and budget is sort of, you know, doesn't really apply. It's they can be extremely low budget, they can be extremely big budget. Uh, but it's more just what kind of film is it? Is it a female driven thriller? Is it a Christmas uh, romance? Uh, is it something along those, those categories that just fits perfectly with what the industry needs year on year? How many goldmine genres are there? Uh, I, I say six. Um, I mean, you can, you can dive a little bit deeper than that, but I mean, it really kind of fits into six. There's Christmas, uh, there is uh, female-driven thriller, there is tween girl. Uh, there's sort of, I, I call it like the aging male action hero film. Uh, there's creature features. And then there are, um, I'd call it like boy, uh, family safe, but boy driven um, adventure story. So that'd be like your treasure hunters uh, kind of uh, spy kids kind of thing. 
um, you know, creature features, those are kind of self-evident and those range from like Sharknado to like very high budgeted Hollywood films. Uh, your aging male action uh, a hero film on the extreme low budget. These are movies that are shot like for less than a million and a half or two million dollars. Um, but they have like Jean-Claude Van Damme or Dolph Lundgren for like one day on set and they're like the mastermind boss at a desk and they edit it so it appears, you know, scattered throughout the film. But the key thing is that they get to be on the poster. Um, Christmas movies, they're self-evident. If you can throw in a dog, that's great. Uh, the tween girl films, um, I really like them when they have a horse in them or if they have some kind of animal, a part of it. Those also work with Christmas. I think Christmas dog movies work well. Uh, Christmas and a horse, that absolutely fits the season if you have a nice snowy background and all. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's, it's, they just work consistently. And you'll see them, like once you kind of categorize it like that, you'll see them every year. Um, uh, big studio films down to like microscopic, microscopic budgetedly titles, like you'll see them. Those are the ones that just Hollywood consistently needs. Um, you see lots of comedies, you see lots of horror. Uh, that stuff is usually developed the other way around, which means that um, a studio is trying to promote a big comedy talent. Uh, and like Comedy Central worked like this for a long time. So if you have somebody like an Amy Schumer, you know, they start, they identified her and they sort of started, they kind of dabbled a bit by testing with like, well, let's do some one hour specials and see how that does. Okay, well, the audience is there, it works. Let's maybe put them in a movie or something. And you see that with a lot of comedy talent, it follows that kind of pattern. So they're not like, it's not like somebody wrote the script and then uh, the studio executives just went, wow, this is great. Let's get this talent to put. It's the opposite way around. They're trying to build a giant brand around a talent and uh, promote that talent in their career. Uh, and horror is very different. Horror is uh, such a fickle genre. It's, um, you need to nail it. And it's, it's the audience is so specific with horror and the attributes that, that um, will land a horror film are very different than other genres. Like who the director is, is, is critical in horror. Uh, and sometimes, so it kind of comes, since the, the director or some key aspect of the genre is actually what keeps the audience engaged or interested, uh, some of the creative ideas actually have to come from that source out and then it maps out. So those are the, I think those are just really hard ones to enter into. And then just like standard issue dramas, like, they're just boring. They, they require so much talent to uh, sell it, and that talent is so expensive. It just makes it really complicated. When you're talking about some of the movies that most screenwriters would be sort of hired for, it would be like just sort of one protagonist. Correct, yeah. It's, it's um, you gotta think of it like barriers to entry. Uh, you know, not to use too much like business jargon in this kind of setting, but I mean, I think screenwriters, if you're, if you're going to be starting a career, you need to think about it as a career in an industry. Um, and I think that the, the easiest point of entry is, yeah, focusing on the one protagonist story. You can have your B plot, you should, but um, it's really got to follow that one protagonist on his or her journey, usually her. It's, it's uh, I, think, I think there's a much larger female audience in general or a much larger need of content for female audiences. Um, so I, I think having a protagonist be female is, is pretty critical in whatever genre you focus on. Let's take the movie with Rob Lowe, the dog movie, that's mm -hmm. done really well on Netflix. But there's also the, the Channing Tatum one. It's, it's a dog movie too. It's a, it, it, it's a great vehicle, yeah. But women like, uh, they, they, it, is, it is an attractive story to have um, a guy with a dog, uh, that combo can actually be quite appealing. They've done a lot of dating studies on this, apparently. Sure, sure, absolutely. What about a guy with a cat? It doesn't quite, doesn't quite nail it the same way. Look, they, we, I mean. <laughs> what if it's an exotic cat? Okay, yeah. And then we've, I think, I've definitely seen the cat film Christmas movie, let's say. I've seen like the cat film tried a few times. It just doesn't land it. Unless the cat, because cats have such a unique character, you know. Why is it important for writers to understand these genres? It's, it's important just to step back and understand how the industry works. 
Uh, and since these are the genres that are just consistently in need, um, focusing a lot of attention on there is, is I think, pretty critical. Like it's, it's, if you're gonna spend all the time to write a script and try to build a career, you might as well focus on something that has like a higher probability of success than something that has a lot more barriers of, of you know, restriction against you. Uh, so if you're just focusing on these genres, understanding and being realistic that like, hey, this is what real people wanna watch, and choosing to write that uh, just makes a little bit more logical sense in terms of like opening your doors of opportunity. And one shouldn't think that these genres are, you know, just overly cliched or, or uh, not important enough. It's, it's, th there's so many stories you can tell within them. And it's, it's, you can dive really deep into character and really convey some amazing ideas, even with these sort of like tried and tested genres. So I don't think they should be dismissed. I think there's a lot of really good opportunity for writers in them. And you're talking about working writers, writers that are not on a TV show, that have a career, that, that make money, that, that support themselves from their scripts to churn out these things. It's not just like a, a one-off art film that they're going to win a contest. These are people that, you know, are building a career off this. Yeah, yeah. These are, these are definitely career writers who, who, like, the writers we work with, we work with them consistently. And they churn out scripts uh, I, I mean, I don't mean to undercut it, but I mean, like, they can write fast and they can deliver quickly. And, you know, they're, they're writing a, a new script every month, maybe every two months, uh, and they're getting paid on them. And so it's like, that is a career. They built that slowly. It took time to build, but they got to a point where they said, like, look, I can deliver tween girl movies, like, really, really well. I can write them very fast. I can write them in, in, in really strong detail. I can v convey some very solid, uh, wonderful ideas within them. I mean, think about what you can do with that. You can explore so many ideas about complications in adolescence, stress you feel with adolescence. You can dive into mental health issues. You can dive into body positivity. You can dive into so many facets all within, like, one cliched idea. And if you're going to be writing these deep, uh, 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 experiences, or if you're going to be writing meaningful stories, and you just put it inside the bright, shiny box of a gold mine genre, like you're going to get noticed. I'm not saying you're going to get the deal. It's like, but like, you might as well do the thing that's going to open more doors of opportunity for you. So if you do some deep, overwhelming coming of age story uh, that's just going to like disappear in somebody's inbox. Or if you say it's a tween girl film and it follows, it's about so and so doing X Y Z, and you know it, it talks about these themes, because it's a tween girl film, it's going to get opened at least by more people. Where would you put Wednesday Adams? That's complicated because um, it is a piece of known IP. It's it's a derivative of something we've known. Uh, through a lot of different variations. The original show, the movie variations in the 90s, they've had a couple of animated um, versions of it. So there already comes a bit of like a cult identity with it. So that falls into what we talked about before in terms of verifiable audience. There's always been a subgroup of people that respond well to those sort of quirky, dark comedies um, or just films that dive deep into that. Uh, and then they just... I guess it's maybe a reboot slash spinoff because you're focused on her. It's sort of a weird hybrid. And Netflix gets to do this because they have so much money. Um, they can really take interesting chances, uh, but it's talent-led, meaning the creative talent-led. Somebody very high up in, in some big agencies basically came to them with the concept. And because it's a known piece of IP, you've got a really good recipe for something there to play with. But it, it is a tween girl film at the end of the day. It's following her and going through a journey, so. Can you have a good meeting where everything goes right and then the executives reject your pitch? Yes, you can. Uh, and it happens quite a bit, actually. And those are for reasons that are sometimes totally out of your control. Um, I was mentioning earlier that sometimes even on our side, we're, we're business to business. So we're dealing directly with presidents of networks or, or heads of channels or VOD platforms. And um, we're in a meeting and we're pitching and presenting our slate of projects. And then uh, unbeknownst to us, behind closed doors in their boardroom, 
They get a new mandate from the top and all of a sudden, you know, metrics come in or there's some kind of a decision at the channel to uh, pivot uh, in terms of content and we find out about it later. And so the next time we have a meeting, uh, it's either we get rejected on titles that we were certain were going to happen um, or we just find out that like, oh, you know, that, that direction you were going all in on is now no longer the case. You're now going over here. So even at our level, that happens. And so I think it's very important for anyone starting out in the industry to remember that like you can pitch something in January and like nobody wants it. And then like July, everyone's looking for that exact same thing. And it's like you, you know, a lot of that is you're just sort of shooting in the dark to a degree. That's why it's important to do as much research as you can, find out the, the kind of core consistencies of what companies are doing, the general trends that networks or VOD platforms are going for, the general buckets of content they focus on, and at least you're like kind of in the right zone. Um, you will never have all of the information. And so, yeah, you can go in. You can be on total good terms with everybody. Um, you, can, you can be presenting yourself extraordinarily well. Your story could be very well received in the room. There could even be some back and forth in terms of paperwork, and then all of a sudden, last second, we're pulling away from this deal. It happens, yes. And I think developing a thick skin and just accepting that and uh, uh, being realistic about that is the only way to battle it and just move on to the next one. And it doesn't, the other thing is critical in that is not to lose your temper. It's to stay well composed. It goes back to the other things. Relationships are key. Uh, 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 it's a lot like dating. Um, it's, it's, you need to be able, and presentation matters even, I guess, in terms of uh, 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 principles of pitching. Like, you need to handle rejection very well and be professional about it and understanding. If you need to, like, take a day before responding, that's fine. But, you know, always respond to it with a, I get it, thanks for the opportunity, et cetera, because then you're keeping that opportunity alive for the future. And guess what? Like those companies will sometimes come back and say, we have this new project, can you write it? So if you, rejection happens, it's part of the game. And can it also happen where you're in the meeting and you get these arms crossed and you think, oh, I've bombed and I just did a horrible job. And then you hear actually that you're their person. Yes, this is, that absolutely happens too. Um, uh, how do I say this? Like it's, it's when you focus on genres that are just, um, the core needs, you know, it's, uh, they know whether it works or not. And like, you know, these are people that get pitched like dozens of projects a day in some cases. Um, I have been in meetings where like the guy showed up late and like was clearly, it didn't look like he was paying attention at all. And um, you're just sort of like, you feel like talking to someone who's just staring at their phone, like pitching to a teenager. And it's like, um, then all of a sudden you get that email like a week later and it's like, so you just gotta go with it. And you know, you can't control, this is what I tell my kids, it's like, you can't control what other people do. You just have to focus on what you are doing and the decisions you are making, how you're presenting yourself and making sure that you're bringing up what you can do, presenting yourself and pitching your ideas in the best way you have the control of doing. And that's not just in the room. That's the, that's if you create a website, if you do your personal brand, like how, you relate, how you relate to people online, the kinds of stuff you type online, that stuff doesn't go away. And <clears throat> you Google enough, you'll find that on people. And so it's very critical that at all times you're conducting yourself in the best manner you can. But yeah, it's like, I've dealt with network executives who it's like, I felt like they didn't even remember that we had a meeting and it's like, Two weeks later, we got a deal. So it happens, yes. What are the five most common reasons a movie idea will be rejected? I think the most obvious one is that it is just out of sync with what the company needs. So it's like, if it's just a genre or a style or, you know, TV show, movie, whatever. It's like, if, it, if the project itself just does not mesh with the core basics of what the company works within, they're not gonna, they're not gonna like turn ship for you, you know? Um, I think a second reason after that is if your project is too similar to other things that are in the market. Um, we work a lot with Christmas movies. 
uh, Christmas romances, and you would think that there's like only five or six versions of the same story you can tell, but the truth is it's infinite. There's always unique slants you can take, but if it's too similar to something that already exists in the market or has been done, uh, especially recently, that's something that we'll just take a step back and say, mm, it's not gonna, not gonna jive with us. Um, third thing, and I think this is where, you, as you go deeper into this, this is when it gets a little bit, um, I guess, more fresh information for writers who might not have visibility to some of these more internal workings. So uh, I would say a third reason is when it focuses on subject matter or interactions of characters that just don't resonate well on screen. And so what I mean, a good example of that would be like something that is way too social media heavy. And I know like social media is it, I mean, you can start whole relationships in today's world via app and other means. So it's like, that's fine, but it doesn't translate really well on screen. And so making sure that visually from beginning to end, this project is actually going to make sense. That's pretty critical. Uh, and then you get to other things that, you know, they don't talk about in screenwriting books and they don't necessarily pitch in film schools. And that's like, what is the budget? The budget's critical. Like if you're writing something that is out of sync with the real world value of what the movie is, it's not going to make any sense. So if you're writing um, a basic TV movie, but you're writing it at a budget that is way above that, it doesn't correlate. The company's not going to see any merit in it because they're going to say, we're not going to pay all this money because we know where the metrics are, we know where the clients are in terms of pricing. Uh, and then if you go a step beyond that, I would say, um, I would say it's production related. And what I mean by that is it's a script that is written in a way that is not production friendly. Uh, most of the people who are reading scripts have a lot of production experience and they can read the script and know like right away, at least ballpark, this is how much these things are gonna cost, whether it's a TV series, whether it's a movie. They know what are the SAG rates, they know what are the crew rates. So if you have a script with like way too many cast members, way too many expensive locations, way too many things that just are complicated to make happen within the budget level of what the project you're working on should be, it's gonna get rejected. But that, that's why I kind of put it in that category, which is it's hard for writers to know what those numbers are. In the book I wrote, uh, Mastering the Pitch, in each section of the book, I kind of devote a chapter to um, like movies and then TV shows and reality TV shows and all that. And I actually put in there, well, what are the budgets supposed to be? So we put those in. So you kind of get a sense of like, you know, and a high end of this would be X dollars. A, a mid-level would be this many dollars and a low budget professional, not like micro budget shoestring budget, but like one that could actually be on TV or like a, an, an original for a VOD platform. What would that low budget look like? So if you can write at that budget level, at a production that makes sense for like 12 to 20 days of production, um, you're starting to kind of remove some of those layers. And then I would say I'd add a six to that, and that's just if the writer's an asshole. If they're just complicated to deal with, it could be a good script and you'll just pass on it. What would a, a, a low, low budget, let's say, film Christmas movie shot in another state, and let's sorry, not California, maybe it's one that has tax incentives, be? What would the budget for a low budget? Uh, so they scale, um, and we don't shoot any of them in LA because LA is extraordinarily expensive to film in. We shoot, and, and we don't necessarily even shoot in the States. We do a lot in Canada and we do a lot in Australia. Um, but in, we do work a lot in tax efficient states. Um, Georgia is a great tax efficient state, uh, uh, but Netflix does so much there that you know it's, it's, it's becoming a lot more expensive to shoot there. But there's a lot of places. We just shot a movie in Kentucky. Um, we shoot a lot of places, but uh, the general budgets are going to be one million ish to two and a half million. Um, but that is like total gross cost. That is like how much cash is required to shoot the movie. But the way we work is that we are being quite financially savvy in terms of how we structure deals how payments are paid out, 
how we classify things. And then if we work in a tax efficient states and we work within very specific parameters and we source talent and crew and utilize local resources, we can get what we call soft monies or tax rebates. Like the idea of soft monies is um, that there's incentive for us shooting these movies in some of these different areas, whether it's like local municipalities or local states, et cetera, they want the business. And so they're willing to sort of uh, uh, really make it worth our while to shoot there instead of other places. Um, so on our side of the business, we're looking for those opportunities. Um, you know, we know our scale of how much this stuff needs to cost. Uh, we know where we can shoot it and how we can shoot it. We also know, well, how many characters do we need in the movie so that we don't exceed our budget? How many locations do we need in there so that we don't exceed our budget? Because you start doing company moves, that gets pretty pricey. So it's, it's a combination of being able to maximize soft monies, tax rebates, pre-sales when they're possible, license fees from a client, and a script that meshes with all of that. So if it's a screenplay that's not fitting into that model, it's, it's not really usable for us. What do you think about the advice, write the script or make the movie you want to watch? Look, I mean, I think uh, I wrote the books I wanted to exist when I was younger. Like it's, I think there is something important to um, be able to uh, uh, express what it is you're trying to say. I think that's absolutely critical. Um, but I would, and, and I have no problem, like I, I, I don't want, writers to think like they should only write these genres and that they should forever turn their back on any passion project they have. Like their passion is what got them into wanting to do this in the first place. They should absolutely follow that uh, uh, at every step of their career. But what I'm saying is utilize these core genres that, that do work, that are in need, and apply what story you want to tell within it. Like these characters, whether it's a tween girl romance, whether it's a female driven thriller, whether it's a Christmas movie, like they, even like creature features, like they, there are real stories and real moments in there that are 100% purely human interactions, human conflict, human struggles uh, and challenges that we can all identify with. Um, you know, there's a lot of kind of stereotypical you would expect sci-fi movies that actually have these very powerful messages in them about how we operate as, as humans. You can say that about zombie movies, what it really reveals about who we are. And I think that they probably, or, or a tween girl movie, what, what it sort of tells about whether you're male or female, like what, what that feels like early in your life when you're stumbling through this transition of childhood to adulthood. And it's not just sex and puberty, it's, it's all of the responsibilities that get thrust on you and balancing how you grew up versus what your personal experiences of the world are and, and all of that. And it's like you can funnel that into something really fun and TV safe and Disney-esque and still be very, you know, powerful in what you're trying to communicate. So I don't think that they should dismiss it. I think they should utilize them. Right. Let's let's say eighth grade. Did you see that film? I, I didn't. Oh, okay. I didn't, uh, okay. So there were probably things that wouldn't maybe be advertiser friendly for TV. I loved it. I know there was a gentleman that walked out of the theater when I was watching, and I was surprised. But it sounds like for what you're talking about is these are working writers. These are people that. They probably pay their rent, pay their car bill, whatever, through writing. Yeah. And if you want to have a career, you can you know, write the next Precious, which is amazing, but that's also very hard to get made. And so these are things that, that are consistent. There's a, there's a formula to them, and they work. People, people watch them. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, like, if you want to have those moments of being a staff writer on a series, if you want to have those moments of like that passion project you want to see made, you need help to do it, and you need a track record to do it, and you need relationships to make that happen. So building a career, showcasing you can do the work, you've done it consistently, you can be dependable, you deliver what you say you're gonna do time and time and time again, and you've showcased, like, my stuff makes you money. Um, you're getting obviously paid for it in exchange, but like my stuff makes this company money. I'm delivering the goods. Let's elevate the relationship. Uh, every, every person I know who's become a director, 
did it by working through the ranks and proving they could do the work before they actually got the job. Every writer I've ever met proved they could write before they got the job. And if you want to see your passion project made, you kind of have to showcase, I get how the industry works. I'm totally in on it I, in terms of you know assisting and playing my role and my part in making that system operate. And now it's my turn to really put something forward and take that first big leap. You need help to do it. It's not, I mean, there's always outliers. I'm sure, I'm sure you know, there's, there's a couple of, you know, pop-up titles sporadically here and there that launched careers. But for the most part, these overnight, you know, success stories are like 10, 15 years of like hard, dedicated work that finally just crisscrossed into the big opportunity. The Boondock Saints. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That'd be one of the, yeah. those stories. And in truth, that time period, that time era was very, very, very different. And that was still when film was the thing and theater was still what it was and it wasn't being utilized quite the same way it was today. And, uh, you know, some of the personalities <laughs> picking that movie up are, you know, they're, 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 how they are viewed in history is very different in today's world. Um, so a lot has changed since then. And I, I don't, I think it's really critical not to hold yourself or judge yourself on how other people built their careers or what milestones they hit and by what age and when, uh, because you're gonna, first off, you're gonna drive yourself nuts and make yourself depressed. And they were operating in time periods and they had a series of opportunities before them that are just different. You gotta work with the ones that are before you. But I think that if you wanna get your passion projects made, Keep them going, keep them in your back pocket. And it's important for writers to be able to like move from this project to that project so that they're not getting too involved and being able to stay fresh on them. Uh, but yeah, if you have that consistent work pattern and you're getting regular deals, you're not selling out, you're being professional and you'll get those opportunities for your own projects too. Sure, and just as distribution has changed and, and how we view things, it sounds like how you get your projects out there. When you said you read Sid Field's screenplay, excellent advice and then the last chapter maybe that's and, and i don't want to speak out of school here but maybe it's outdated at this point in, in a sense like it goes back to principles versus you know trends and all that like yeah i think the, the the version of the book that i read like suggested you still mail a hard copy with a self-addressed stamped envelope and all that stuff it's like our time is just very different today but um the concept of reaching out getting it in front of people speaking, learning how to speak about your project, learning to speak with confidence, which is a skill in and of itself. And it's one that many people struggle with. And it's okay, there, there's, there's no shortage of videos on YouTube to like learn how to better present yourself. But the truth is you just gotta get out there. You gotta get your hands dirty. You, you, you gotta get your boots on the ground and, and sort of make the opportunities happen. When pitching, should a writer speak 100% about the story or should they also talk about the business viability of the project? I think both. I think um, that's really at the end of the day what it is. It's a, it's a creative project that answers a business problem. And I think screenwriters do need to view what they're presenting as a business case in addition to a story. Story is critical. And um, what happens in that story, how it is presented, how it unfolds. Again, even in these like core genres that you think are overly cliched, it's like there's a lot of story development. And the number of hours I've been on the phone or a Zoom talking about one project that's just a, a, a Christmas story, like it's, it's, um, it's quite intense. Uh, but yeah, it's so story is critical, but it being able to answer the problems of the platform or the network is also critical. So when we have those, usually starts in this kind of like process where it's first, I'm working with a writer and I'm working with a network or VOD platform separately. I get the deal opportunity closed, then we get that script mapped out, written, contracted, etc. 
then we get everybody in the room together and have that big creative conversation. And uh, yeah, during that process, it's we're pitching the script, but we're also pitching it as a business case and why it's going to make that company money or why it's going to bring in audience or what things does it need to have in it that are going to help them grow their grow their company, grow their audience base, or um, you know, increase revenues. And when you're on a phone call back and forth about a project for many months, is it is it story driven that you're that you're discuss? Is it story based that you're discussing issues, or is it location, all of the above? It's all of the above. I, I mean, story, you know, is the big filter. It's got to work. The theme has to work. Uh, the character has to follow the right journey. Um, but how that happens? Yeah, we 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 do dive a lot into the the tangible, uh, uh, I guess, technicality of how are we actually gonna execute this thing? Because it's not just words on the paper. You're gonna have to have a crew behind the camera. So if that conversation is taking place in a car while it's driving, why? Like, just put it on a bench, you know? <laughs> put it someplace that's easy to shoot. Um, uh, the number of characters. And there's, you know, I, I just had a conversation with a writer um, days ago and she was very specific about wanting a character in a scene with no dialogue um, because story-wise she felt it was very important and I'm sort of in this situation of sort of explaining yeah but we got to pay all this extra money for them to be on set for that one day and they may not need to be there and it does there is a kind of a balance in terms of like cost economics commerce versus the creative storytelling uh, budgets are tight on a lot of productions, and so you have to balance that. So it, it's it's a big hybrid. And it's usually, you're talking both at the same time on specific points. But story opens the door, and I would say the, the, um, the details of the execution, the business case, are what close the deal. Are there any pitching myths that screenwriters should be aware of? I don't know if there's any, like, specific myths, but I would say the myths would be um, believing that like there's one way to pitch, that there's like a memorized log line you should have, that you go in and like they always call it like the elevator pitch, that like this is your one shot and that's totally not true at all. And it goes back to the whole principle of like pitching is repitching. It's like you can repitch the same project dozens of times, it's okay. But that idea that like you're just gonna memorize a log line and you're gonna say it once and that you're gonna get this big check and like that's that's it's done. That that's a total myth, and that's totally not how it works in real life. Um, and then I would say another myth is the quote, we're buying it in the room kind of idea that like um, that you, you go into your meeting, you present it. And then like they buy it in the room and all that. It's like, I know there are like a handful of stories out there of these things sort of happening. Um, what was the guy's name? Joe e Esterhouse, I think. Uh, you know, it's like wrote an idea on a napkin at a bar while he was hammered and like, you know, made millions off it. And it's like, it's not quite really how it worked. The agent was out there to get the next script of his because his previous work was so successful, they didn't care what he put. The job that executive or agent or whomever did the deal with him had was to basically like write a check, whatever he says, and just get something in writing. That, that was the objective, you know? It's like those, I think, kind of fall into myths about how things work. Was this for Basic Instinct? I know Basic Instinct was his original, like that he, he got so much success for, but then his like latter work um, I don't. I don't know all the films. Right, that, right, but right. It's like there was a series of films that got made uh, uh, after that, and everyone was hoping to get the cash cow of Basic Instinct because it was such a big success at the time. I don't know what ninety and ninety one something like right. that. Mm -hmm. uh, so like early nineties, there were a lot of those movies floating out there. Big checks. He's one of those very few screenwriters who had that much control and that much clout. And I don't know if he's in you know, an everyday, you know, a name that everybody knows per se, even in our industry, but like, there's quite a few people who know his name over other screenwriters, let's say. Sure. But those are rare. Those would be your myths. Right. It doesn't work like that. Never, certainly, I've never seen it happen. 
Well, here's one myth. Identify an untapped or underserved market. That is a myth of uh, this belief that because it's never been seen before, people therefore will want to see it. And that's not true at all. It's, um, I have seen some wacky projects presented as opportunities that were just like, there's no audience for this and it doesn't fit anywhere. It's like, it's, it's, you're, you're trying to pitch or present um, a character or a story that is, uh, uh, I'm not saying not relevant to very small circles of people, but it's like, it's so limited, it's just not gonna reach the like viability of funding. If you want to make it, go for it, but you got to find alternative sources for the revenue. But like just going in and waving a script or a project and saying, it's never been seen before, therefore it's a ticket to an opportunity. It's not. It's like, it's got to fit into those kind of core buckets and genres. Why are fewer movies made for people over age 55? Because they buy less, generally. Um, they tend to not be... People who are, we'll call them elderly, I guess it was still the politically correct term now. It's, uh, uh, it's, if you're in that category of age, you are less likely to be buying or consuming stuff, products at the same rate somebody who's in their 30s or their 20s would be. If you're talking theater tickets, Older audiences don't go to the theater nearly as often as younger audiences. If you're talking TV content, they don't watch nearly as much television as younger audiences. If you're talking subscription VOD platforms, they're not as likely to be having six, seven subscription VOD platforms uh, that they're, they're popping back and forth between. Um, as a result, there's just fewer content that is directed towards older audiences and produced for them. Or the way you do it is you find content that just generally speaks to a larger demographic of people that can be viewed there. Now there are a couple of examples. Columbo, Murder, She Wrote, uh, uh, was the, the lawyer show. Uh, and they've done reboots of some of these too. Um, so there are, and, and there's Acorn TV. It's a really good SVOD platform. It was bought by AMC Networks. And that's its real target demo is, is that sort of like middle-aged to slightly older female audience that's gonna watch cozy mysteries like Miss Marple and you know, uh, uh, Agatha Raisin. And, and you know, we did a bunch of Doc Martin uh, programs with them and we did a few other uh, 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 shows with them back with my previous company. So um, there are outlets for them, but they're not nearly as many as younger audiences. Like I think it's, that goes into one of those things like myths. It's, it's just because there's not content for older audiences doesn't mean like, well, I'm gonna write you know, a movie that's aimed at them because no one's doing it. And it's sort of a thing of like, there's a reason why there's not as much produced for them. Myth number two. Pitching is an art. Yeah, it's, it's, there's this belief that, um, I think people have this belief about a lot of things that like, there's only some people that can do it and they do it well. And it's like, I really genuinely don't believe that. I think that there's not one way to pitch. I think what's critical is that you pitch the way you want to pitch. Um, it's not an art form in the sense of like somebody is just brilliantly skilled at it. I mean, obviously there are people more comfortable walking into a room and talking than others, but your ability to learn how to do it, your ability to improve your capability of doing it, your ability to present yourself, your ideas in a professional way and be able to make a business case for why your script or why your projects should be taken seriously. Anybody can learn this stuff. Not many people take the time to learn it. They're easy to, it's very easy just to say, you know, somebody doesn't know what they're talking about if they're like presenting this kind of concept, but it's like, the truth is you can teach yourself how to do this. You can teach yourself how to be professional and how to talk the talk, walk the walk, et cetera. When people talk about pitching a project, are they talking about a big Hollywood studio project or an independent film project? Like how are they different and how would the pitching be different? So, um, for somebody new to the industry, you're not gonna be able to go to Paramount or Warner Brothers and just like get on the lot and get to a top executive and pitch. 
Um, there, there, there's literally walls around them, so you're not going to get in. Uh, but uh, if so, if you're starting out, you would be working more with independent distributors, production companies, and they are much more accessible, and they are producing way more content than the studios are actually producing. At the studio level, the way they work is, if you ever go to a lot, um, there's all of these like random buildings. There's obviously the big sound stages, and then there's like the corporate executive offices. But then there's all these like random offices around the place, and those are production companies generally contracted by the studio to just essentially be a filter for the studio to acquire content, to develop content, specifically to go into the studio machine. So again, you're not pitching to the studio, you're pitching to that production company that is in the sphere of the studio, we'll say. Uh, but how is it really different? In truth, it's really not. It's the numbers on paper can be sizably different, but um, you know, it's it's, what things cost can be different, but as far as like being able to pitch a genre that is constantly in need, being able to pitch a story that fits that genre well, and being able to pitch a story that fits that genre that is also economically feasible and realistic to produce, it's kind of the same across the board. Now, it's really hard to go in as somebody who doesn't have a track record and do that at the studio level for multi-million dollar films, but you have a really good opportunity to do it at the independent level. And if you do it consistently at the independent level, you can work your way up. That's why I really present a lot of these ideas to help people kind of start careers because it's a long, long tail game. It's not something that happens overnight and it is something that you build over a long period of consistent habits and good work. And it's not something that happens right out of film school? Certainly not. Uh, it's, it's, you just, it's, it's not that, you know, film schools don't teach students like really good practical skills. And some film schools have amazing programs that get students right into studios or internships, et cetera. Um, but you need real world working experience and uh, it can take time to get. And it's, it's realizing some of those ideas that you get at film school that you just wanna rush out there and sort of take on the world, so to speak, which is amazing to have the passion, but being able to actually say, okay, now in the real world, how does this process really work? And it goes back to what are the core genres? What, it, what does Hollywood need to function? It's a giant industry. It's, it's worth, you know, it's, it's multi, multi, multi billions of dollars transacting. It's, it's, you've gotta be able to help that machine function and you've gotta be useful within it. Of the three books that you've written, which chapter do you wish you'd had advice on when you started in this industry? That is an awesome question. Um, I think the most critical thing that I put in all, I put them in all three books. That's, that's kind of how strongly I feel about it. It's realizing that very, it's, it's two things. It's realizing it's not script to screen, it's the reverse of that. It's you start at the end, which is what do people want to watch, and you work your way backwards all through the process. What do people want to watch? What genres do they need? How much does it need to cost? What is an IP that works? And then it goes back to, okay, who's gonna write it? It's that process. And then realizing what distribution actually was and how it actually worked as a business. Because there's not many of us in the distribution world. It's a pretty small group of people and a pretty small handful of companies that really work in it. Um, but we're like making the bulk of the decisions of what content gets created and who creates it. Not, not me personally, but I mean just the group of people working in the distribution game. I don't think there's enough of that focused on in film school at all. Um, I, I'm not sure why that is. I am sensing because the introduction to media distribution book has been adopted at a couple of universities um, and it's, we're getting a second edition of it. Like I, it's the getting some traction and I think that that is growing, but it's, you gotta understand distribution. And I think that was the thing that I wish I knew. I, I will say this, I, I, when I first came out to LA, I like thought I was like, 
I thought I had it all figured out and I just like it, I had no idea what I was doing when I got here. And like everything I thought I knew was wrong and I could not figure out how does this industry work? I couldn't figure it out. And it wasn't until years later, I took my first, what would be my first distribution job. And I took it because I just needed a job because it was like I was working on movie sets doing lighting work and it was inconsistent. And it was either go back to waiting tables in between jobs or go get a real adult job. So I did the latter, I got a real adult job and it turned out to be a sales job in the business. And I, I was, I didn't even know you could sell TV shows or movies. And I, all of a sudden, once I learned that process, everything started to make sense about how the industry works. And that's when I started going to Cannes. That's when I started going to all these markets. And all of a sudden I was on that side of the table. And I mean, I was a production assistant on my first movie and I, I was just dabbling project to project to project. And then uh, uh, just a couple of years later, I was in Cannes and the director of that movie was pitching me a story. So it's like, it does, it's, it's so, this distribution thing is so critical in terms of like, that is the filter where the whole industry crisscrosses through. That is the intersection. Very long-winded way of saying, I wish I knew about distribution in film school.